Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. If you are seeing this, it is a miracle. The hits over the last few weeks just won't stop. I gotta go in for emergency dental surgery right now. I just turned 36 a few months ago and my body was like, and nothing is ever gonna work at the same again. Welcome. No, we're not gonna spread it all at once. So yeah, in addition to the, the pushes at the beginning, I've been saying jump in on the, the beautifulbastard.com. Drop the March drop is amazing. Thank you for making it the most successful to date. I also gotta say, if you are seeing this video, hit that like button, give that love for the team just carrying my broken ass up the steps over the past few weeks, and let's just jump into it. You know, the first thing that we're gonna talk about today are these huge updates regarding the David Dobrik, Jeff Wittig situation. Right, Wittig's been calling Dobrik out a lot lately, and while there's been no shortage of David Dobrik controversies over the last year, this largely has to do with the incident where David was operating an excavator while Jeff was swinging from it as part of a stunt, leading to an accident that nearly killed Jeff. And while yes, he survived, he also suffered meaningful injuries to his eye and his brain. And while Jeff surprisingly stood by David at first in the aftermath of all of this, we've seen him in recent weeks saying he's done being fake friends with him, calling him a scumbag. Jeff also talking about the incident again in the upcoming Casey Neistat documentary about everything that happened with David Dobrik during this time on his podcast, with Jeff saying that he saw footage from the film where David tries to pin the whole situation on him. And so this has led to a lot of people going, okay, well, what happens next, whether it be before or after the release of this documentary. Are we going to see Jeff Wittig divulge more information? Is he actually going to finally sue David Dobrik? Will David Dobrik actually respond? And while that last thing seemed incredibly unlikely because David's always very quiet about any sort of controversy until he really has to, he ended up talking about the situation on his Views podcast yesterday. With David saying they actually invited Jeff on for a discussion about this, but Jeff declined. And so regarding the incident, we saw David talking about the day of the accident and saying, That day uh, is like the worst the worst thing that's ever happened to me and i wish i could i would do anything to take that day back um my hand is shaking um like yeah i mean anything like i'm being dead like i wish it was me up there i wish whatever with him adding that it was unfortunate and shitty but that it was an accident i also want to make that clear i don't know if people think that that there's there's never a world where I would ever want that to happen to a person. It was never, I was never up there like driving the thing, wanting to hurt him or whatever it was. Like that was never the thing. And claiming that there are lots of layers as to why Jeff has been mad at him lately, but he thinks that it largely stems from one main issue explaining. I think one of the main reasons um, Jeff is bummed with me right now is um, because he saw me do, uh, he saw me do an interview where I said something that I promised him I'd keep between us. And as far as what that was, David claims here that the stunt was actually Jeff's idea. Saying, yeah, we had other stunts and activities planned for that video, but Jeff apparently wanted to take this to the next level with David claiming. He's like, this is boring as shit. What are we like, preschoolers? Like, let's do something cool. And he said he wanted to swing from it. And I loved the idea. I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. I remember Jeff told me to check my DMs. And it was, it was a video that he found 15 minutes before the accident that somebody posted and he said, let's recreate this. And it was a guy swinging from an excavator and flying off. I didn't see that DM till the hospital. With David then alleging. And then he asked, he's like, can you, can you, pro can you promise me one thing? And I said, what? And he's like, can you just promise that no one ever knows that this was my idea? And I was like, absolutely. And so it's essentially saying that was the promise that David had broke, but he says he doesn't know why this upset Jeff so much because no matter what, David feels that it's clear that he was the one driving the excavator and that Jeff was the victim of the accident, with David calling it the biggest regret in his life. And with all of this, David mentioned other things, saying that he's had a hard time communicating with Jeff since the accident, that he hasn't been able to tell if he wants space or if the space makes things worse, but also adding that when it comes to the blame. I can take, you know, 80% of the responsibility, 90%, 100% of the responsibility for the accident, whatever he needs me to do. But that, you know, then when it gets to the point where it started to feel like I was taking 150% of the responsibility, right. I started to see things like, like David forced his friend up there, like all this kind of stuff, like that was just insane. With him adding that it was a combined decision that led to an accident which he is incredibly sorry for. And regarding the money, because that is a topic that keeps coming up, he says that he has covered some of Jeff's surgery, saying that he's paid $78,000 in medical costs so far, but he has not paid more recently, explaining. I don't love the fact that he's going around saying I don't pay for surgeries. Like that hurts. Like I want to help him. Sure. I really truly do. Yeah. And like he still has my word. And so as far as why he says he hasn't paid lately, he says that he wants to, but the communication just hasn't been there and adding. We're just not getting looped into anything. Mm -hmm. And then and then we're blindsided when he goes to another surgery and then he'll like come out and be like like his most recent surgery, 
I didn't know that he had a surgery until he unfollowed me on Instagram. And saying that this incident constantly weighs on him and then eventually addressing Jeff by saying, There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about this and I'm so sorry that this happened to you, Jeff. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And but today we actually saw Jeff responding on his own podcast, pretty much doing a point by counterpoint that I'll link in the description down below. You should definitely watch it if you're interested in the story. But here's a lot of the highlights. I saw Corinna swing on it a little bit like that. And then I was like, oh, yeah, this looks fun. Swinging, just swinging like a rope swing attached to a tree. Not whipping the thing around 60 miles per hour. I, I agree. I hopped on the rope to do the first part, which was just a simple like a rope swing off a tree you just swing back and forth it's a swing when that's not while like the thing is swinging fast that was no, never discussed that was completely on you i didn't mean literally i'm sitting on the beach i'm watching todd wakeboard for six hours i scroll down i see 50 cent posted the same thing so i send it to david thinking he's in there like not checking his phone because he's operating this thing and maybe he would look at it later as a joke if you're watching something so ridiculous happen in real life and then you see a meme of the same shit that 50 cent post of course i dm it to him as a joke if it was clearly a joke that you didn't see until way after the accident why are you putting that in here and victim blaming my one last wish was david please please don't tell anyone that this was my idea are you out of your mind are you that sick in the head i've never once in my life said david i know i know i might die right now but if i die make sure nobody ever knows that i asked you to smash my head into the crane you sick sociopath with all of that showcase we're hearing from both sides i'd love to pass the question off to you what are your thoughts with with everything that we're seeing and hearing right now and then let's talk about this situation with ryan coogler who if, if you don't know is the fantastic director behind movies like creed black panther fruitvale station and ryan is in the news because he got arrested because he was identified as a bank robber with tmz reporting today that staffers at a bank of america in atlanta thought that he was attempting to rob the bank leading to coogler being put in handcuffs and according to a police report obtained by tmz this actually happened back in january but it's only being reported reported now. And so what's believed to have happened is that Coogler allegedly walked into a bank in standard COVID attire, wearing a mask and sunglasses, then slipping the teller withdrawal slip with a note on the back. That note reportedly saying, I would like to withdraw $12,000 cash from my checking account. Please do the money count somewhere else. I'd like to be discreet. And while this was a harmless message and encounter, considering the note and the amount of money, the teller thought that it was suspicious and the cops were called for an attempted robbery. With a report also saying that when the teller went to make the transaction, it allegedly triggered an alert, which is part of why she reached out to her boss and decided to call 911. So when the cops arrived, they detained two people waiting for Coogler outside, later cuffing Coogler. But reportedly, the police eventually realized this was a mistake, claiming the fault was with the teller, who the report said was a pregnant black woman. With Coogler giving a statement to Variety saying the situation should have never happened. However, Bank of America worked with me and addressed it to my satisfaction, and we have moved on. With Bank of America saying we deeply regret the incident occurred, it should have never happened, and we have apologized to Mr. Coogler. But the situation has prompted a massive conversation online, people wondering how a person attempting to draw money from their own account could be perceived as a robbery. But we have seen others blaming Coogler, saying it's just kind of sketchy to do the note thing. But Others saying that his note or what he was wearing shouldn't have impacted this situation, tweeting things like, We've been wearing masks for two years because we're in a pandemic and there are really a bunch of you trying to criminalize Ryan Coogler's attire to justify racial profiling. Others adding things like, Certain demographics thinks it's funny that Ryan Coogler was mistaken for a bank robber because he wore a mask and shades and wrote a note for money from his account. But imagine being a disabled black person who can't communicate verbally or finds it difficult to. So there is that, but also I'll say whenever I've had to take out a large withdrawal from a bank, I've never felt so nervous. Like people get robbed every day when the, the robber doesn't know what's in your pockets, but if they know you have $12,000, uh, that's a target. But from that, I wanna take a second to thank today's sponsor, KiwiCo. KiwiCo makes awesome hands-on projects and activities aimed at inspiring young innovators as well as defining the future of play by making it engaging and fun. Each crate is designed to expose kids to a wide range of concepts in Steam, science, technology, engineering, art, math, and overall, they're a fantastic resource for learning at home. These monthly crates are designed by experts, tested by kids, and teach a new theme through hands-on learning and fun. Basically, KiwiCo wants kids to be fearless innovators by designing projects to help develop those skills. And KiwiCo includes everything you need, so don't worry about having to run out for extra supplies. And honestly, Lindsay and I love how these crates provide hours of entertainment for the kids and provide an opportunity for special moments with them as we do these projects together. Not to mention, KiwiCo is a solid option for holiday gifting. They offer eight subscription lines each, 
catering to different age groups and topics from toddlers up to adults. So if you want to check it out, just head on over to KiwiCo.com slash DeFrancoWare. You can get 30% off your first month of any crate. And then it's time for everyone's favorite game show. Congress actually did a thing. Yesterday, the Senate passed a massive $107 billion overhaul of the U.S. Postal Service in a widely bipartisan vote of 79 to 19. And a bill called the Postal Service Reform Act has already been approved by the House and now it just heads to Biden's desk for his expected signature. And this legislation, which has been described as the largest reform of the Postal Service in nearly two decades has been a long time coming. Right, for years, the USPS has been teetering on the brink of going insolvent, in large part because of a law enacted in 2006 that requires the agency to pre-fund retiree health care benefits for its employees. But since 2011, the financial burden of that program, combined with the loss of revenues partially driven by the declining volume of mail, forced the agency to default on those health care payments. And so then, in the summer of 2020, calls to reform the agency were bolstered after a series of operation changes made by Trump-appointed Postmaster General Louis DeJoy caused serious delays and other major issues ahead of the election. So to address to those issues, the Postal Service Reform Act removes the retirement health care mandate instead, requiring retired USPS employees to enroll in Medicare when they're eligible, with lawmakers estimating that that change alone will save the agency a whopping $50 billion in payments and eliminate $57 billion in past due postal liabilities in the next 10 years. And very, very notably, the move is also expected to save taxpayers $1.5 billion over the next decade while barely adding any cost to Medicare. And in addition to that new policy, the bill would also set new transparency standards for the USPS, require the agency give Congress regular financial reports, directed to set up a dashboard for the publication of delivery data customers can search, and expand special rates for local newspaper distribution. So obviously this is a big deal for the USPS, but also there's a question connected to this that many people still have. Will this help the mail-in ballot process ahead of the 2022 midterm election? Right, mail delays under DeJoy became a massive point of political contention in 2020, and with states imposing even tougher restrictions on mail-in balloting this year, we're just gonna have to wait to see how all this plays out. And then, let's talk about Florida, because yesterday the Florida Senate passed the controversial measure dubbed the Don't Say Gay Bill that would prevent school districts from discussing sexual orientation or identity with young students. This legislation being approved in the state Senate less than two weeks after the Florida House did the same, though very notably it faced bipartisan opposition in both chambers, but it still made its way through and it is now sure to be signed by the King of Florida himself, Ron DeSantis, who has repeatedly defended it in public, parroting the talking points that it's about parental rights and continually claiming that critics in the media are misrepresenting the legislation to create tensions, with the press secretary at one point even going as far to literally say that the opponents of this measure are groomed. But on the other side of this, we've seen a massive wave of backlash over the legislation. Over the last week, hundreds of students across Florida have staged walkouts, with those protests also continuing today following the state Senate's passage of the bill. We've also seen some big names chiming in, condemning the proposal, trying to get movement from people that follow them, like Ariana Grande and Shawn Mendes, as well as people like former Olympic skater Johnny Weir sharing their personal story, writing, I knew I was gay when I was six and would have greatly appreciated more representation, acceptance, and education while I was growing up. To all the kids in Florida, there is a vast community here to help who love you just the way you are and who will answer any questions you have. But with all this, critics haven't just been targeting DeSantis and Republican lawmakers who have been in support of this bill. We've also seen a ton of pressure on Disney, which is one of the largest employers in Florida because of its theme parks, with people calling on them to denounce the legislation and accusing the company of giving donations to lawmakers who support it. And with this, last week, you had hundreds of LGBTQ plus advocates holding demonstrations outside Disney's theme parks in both California and Florida. And in recent days, LGBTQ plus Disney employees have also taken to social media to call on the company to speak out. But in a statement on Monday, the Disney CEO said that while the company does support its LGBTQ plus employees, it doesn't want to weigh in on political issues, saying corporate statements do very little to change outcomes or minds. Instead, they are often weaponized by one side or the other to further divide and inflame. And while he did say that the company would be, quote, reassessing our advocacy strategies around the world, including political giving, he didn't specify if it would end donations to those who supported the bill. But that statement and stance only ended up prompting more anger from critics, with many noting that the, quote, we won't get involved in politics argument is bullshit. One, because inaction or staying on the sidelines of an issue is an action, right? Because that in itself is a choice, but also because, two, the company has previously been vocal in its opposition to anti-gay rights and abortion bills in Georgia. And literally just last week, they stopped releasing movies in Russia because of the war. Which is why critics have said, okay, Disney only wants to be political unless it hits a certain number. But the final thing that I'll note on here is this is not just going to be a Florida issue. Right? We're obviously going to have to watch what happens when this bill gets signed by DeSantis and, and, the, and the backlash and the impact that we see there, but there are also similar proposals being floated in other states right now. And then finally today, of course, we need to talk about Putin's war in Ukraine. So first, there are reports of more ceasefire is being announced so that civilians can leave combat zones, although at the same time, just like in past incidents, there are also reports of Russian forces hitting evacuation routes and killing non-combatants. Then, if Ukrainian officials are to be believed, we might have an impending disaster at Chernobyl, with a company that operates the plant's power supply saying in a statement, because of military actions of Russian occupiers, the nuclear power plant in Chernobyl was fully disconnected from the power grid. The nuclear station has no power supply. And to be clear, authorities are saying that the power to the plant was damaged, not just like unplugged. And without power, it's feared that the system meant to cool the reactors won't work properly, leading to a meltdown in radiation leaks. 
The plant has diesel generators with fuel for 48 hours, and Ukraine is pushing for a ceasefire to allow workers to fix the plant's power supply. But it also looks like the fears about meltdowns could be misplaced, with the International Atomic Energy Agency not seeming especially worried about the loss of power, pointing out on Twitter that, quote, in this case, we see no critical impact on safety. The IAEA says heat load of spent fuel storage pool and volume of cooling water at Chernobyl nuclear power plant is sufficient for effective heat removal without need for electrical supply. Or in layman's terms, there's enough water to cool the system without power. Now that being said, the agency isn't happy about the situation either, with its head saying on Tuesday that the power should be restored to restart safeguard monitoring systems. And then we should talk about the saga of Polish fighter jets. Right, so here, Ukraine's been asking for more aircraft from the West and the EU, and in particular, Poland, who has seemed on board with the plan. But that quickly faded after it was revealed that the EU foreign policy chief who made the promise apparently went a bit too far. And then over the weekend, American Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in talks with Poland over sending Soviet era planes to Ukraine, something that was apparently approved on Monday, and it seemed like, okay, cool, problem solved. Well, no, because think about it, as far as countries, do you want to be the country that Russia can blame for escalating the war and giving them some excuse to act even more irrationally in the future. So Poland pulls this surprise move, saying that it's ready to deploy immediately and free of charge all their MiG-29 jets to the Ramstein Air Base and place them at the disposal of the government of the United States of America, with them only asking that a sale be set up for newer planes, which was in line with the discussion Secretary of State Antony Blinken already had. And so now, if Ukraine wants to get those jets, the U.S. would need to be the one to hand them over. But also with that, it looks like the U.S. doesn't want to be that guy, because last night the Pentagon said in a statement that the proposal was not tenable. And adding to that, the statement read, the prospect of fighter jets at the disposal of the government of the United States of America departing from a U.S. NATO base in Germany to fly into airspace that is contested with Russia over Ukraine raises serious concerns for the entire NATO alliance. So it's looking like, for the time being, the Polish MiGs are staying put. But also at this rate, things could change at any time. And then finally, as far as what we're talking about today, Russia is also trying to hit back at countries that have sanctioned it, issuing a decree last night that would ban the export of a ton of commodities until December 31st. Now that said, we aren't exactly sure which will be banned. It's still being decided by the Russian cabinet, and they have two days to make a list of that, and also a list of which countries will be affected. But you know, that could have a pretty huge impact. But it's not just oil. They're also one of the largest producers of grains, aluminum, nickel, and palladium. And so following the announcement, it wasn't a surprise that prices for nickel and palladium have already spiked. So all of this will likely have a huge impact on economies around the world, but also especially in Russia, especially on everyday people. Right? I mean, they already can't take out more than $10,000 in foreign currency from their bank accounts right now. That's kind of a huge deal because in Russia, bank accounts can be opened with any kind of currency. So many have accounts with various types of currency. And essentially freezing that will not only have an impact on oligarchs, but plenty of other middle-class citizens. And unfortunately, with the way that Putin has been acting, it increasingly looks like the only way this war is going to end is if the Russian people get fed up with their government. Because it feels like with any question we have in every corner we turn where people say, no, he, Putin wouldn't do that. At the very least, he's a rational actor. Putin has consistently proven those people wrong. I mean, it's part of the reason people keep saying, I mean, we have to give Putin some sort of off-ramp. Is there an off-ramp? But ultimately, that is where we are with this. We're gonna have to wait to see what happens. And of course, whether it be this story or anything else, I'd love to know your thoughts on this situation. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching, liking, subscribing, sharing these videos with your friends and family to try and help spread some common sense. Also, hey, friendly reminder, you only got a few days left if you want to snag something from beautifulbastard.com. You're gonna love it. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. Hopefully, unless the fucking sky drops on my head. Ugh. I'm fine. Everything's fine.